Hello, I'd like to thank you once again for tuning in to this week's message. If you'd like more information about Journey Church, its various ministries, be sure to check us out at journeychurch.org or find us on Facebook where you can get additional resources to help you just grow in your walk of faith. We hope to see you sometime. If you're ever in the Jacksonville area, come on in and say hello. God bless you. Take care. Bye-bye. So we are kicking off this new series today called Reboot. Um, it's a time of vision casting next week. And today it's a time of really examining ourselves and our hearts and seeing if there's areas in our life that might be stuck and in need of a reboot. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll get started. Father, we thank you. This church is alive, Lord. You are changing lives. You are touching people. And Father, we can't thank you enough for allowing us to be um, playing even a small role in that. Today, as we begin to dive into your word, as we examine it, would you use it to stir our hearts? For those who might not call themselves believers, would you do a miracle in their heart today where they would seek after you? They walked in here with one thing in mind. May they leave with you on their mind. Father, for those of us who are believers, would you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, help us to examine our own hearts throughout the course of this message, and if there's areas that need refining, if there's areas that need upgrades, if there's areas that need a reboot, would you help us today in Jesus' name, amen. So before I became a pastor, I spent much of my life in the IT field. I was the IT guy, the help desk guy, who you would call to seek out some help when your computer was stuck, when your computer wasn't working the way that you wanted it to. So I thought this morning, I'd show you a short video of a couple of my previous coworkers. I'm an information technology professional. Everyone here calls me the IT guy. My name is Dennis. I've always been pretty good with computers. It's a curse. Look, just reboot it. You know what's a safe, secure password? Trick question. There aren't any. The nice thing about my job is that everyone's nice to me because they fear me and they should. I practice a Zen-like patience, which is helpful when I need to plug in five broken Macs and pretend that you're not all stupid which you are. I'm kind of like a contemporary Mr. Fixit who has access to all of your personal information. You see this? I can fix this in five minutes. But Ted, Ted's gonna buy me pizza. Some people like to make fun of me because I'm not cool or whatever. Those people, I like to move their checking account balance one decimal to the left. True passion? Relaxing at home with my family fixing their computers. Computers are my real co-workers. Someday they'll replace all of you and I'll finally know peace. Hello, IT. Have you tried turning it off and on again? Hello, IT. Have you tried turning it off and on again? Hello, IT. Yeah, have you tried turning it off and on again? Hello, IT. <laughs> Something's wrong with my computer. Have you tried turning it off and on again? No, no, no. Oh dear, thanks. Hello, IT. Have you tried turning it off and on again? Experience before, right? You've called and you've sought out some help and uh, you said you've got that answer. Have you rebooted your computer? Some of you are a little more tech savvy, so you reboot your computer before you call and when you get on the phone, you say, I've already rebooted my computer. Now, will you help me? Uh, so we learned a lot of patience. We learned a lot of things being computer professionals. And uh, when you start to think about computers, I think you're going to find through today's message that there are actually a lot of analogies that play really well with our spiritual lives. So why does a computer maybe need to re be rebooted? What are some of the reasons why that might happen? Sometimes um, the operating system, maybe the coding was just a little bit bad and you've run a bunch of different programs and they didn't all play well together and you're noticing that your computer is getting a little bit slow, it's a little bit more lethargic than it used to be, it's not doing everything the way that you want and you actually have a little bit of time and then you reboot the computer and then it comes back up and it's faster than it was before, it got those updates and now it's performing just a little bit better than it was prior to that reboot. God forbid you might get a virus. Has anybody ever had a virus on their computer, right? It's 
Those are no fun, right? So sometimes you get a virus and one of the things you have to do is reboot the computer into safe mode in order to get it to come back up and then the computer professional can kind of remove that virus from there, get your computer back up and running the way it was supposed to and then you can use that computer again, right? There's this new string of viruses, though, that's called ransomware. And ransomware is particularly nasty. You could reboot the computer in the traditional way, and it will not help you one bit. If you want to get your data back, you actually have to pay a ransom in order to get the computer information back so that you could use it again. Let's draw a spiritual analogy. There, analogy. there is one who paid a ransom for you because there is stuff in your life that you could never recover yourself. There's no way you could turn it around. You needed one apart from you to come in and pay that ransom so that you could have hope, that you could have freedom, that you could have life. Jesus did that for you. Can I get an amen? Amen. Y'all are much quieter than first, first service. I preach much better when you respond, when you look at me, when you smile. I mean, don't be out there like, oh, come on, Jesus. Might be time for an upgrade, right? How many of you are looking for that new iOS 11 version with the new iPhone 8 or the iPhone X or whatever they're calling it now? Bigger, better, stronger, and only $1,000. Come on, Jesus, right? (laughs) But in order to take advantage of those new features, you got to reboot the computer so that the system applies what it needs so it can go on to the next stage. So I think... There's some biblical analogies that we can begin to draw. Implications both personally in terms of organizations and in terms of the church. So oftentimes when I preach, I like to present maybe, here's the areas of the church and what is that global impact for us, for our church or for the church universal. And then I bring it back to our own lives and seek out how we might apply it. But today I'm actually gonna do the opposite. I wanna start today by focusing on us. I want to start by examining our hearts and looking at the different areas of our lives and see if we might find ourselves at the place where we need a spiritual reboot so that our lives might be upgraded or we need a spiritual reboot because things seem stuck and not in order, right? All of us have those moments in life where we need that nudging or that reminder from God to reboot that we might get back on track where he would have us be. That's what today's about. Next week, I want to encourage you to come back. I beg you. I plead with you. I encourage you. Next week, we're going to be casting a vision for rebooting our church. We have an 800-person strong church that is absolutely awesome, but there's so many people outside of the walls of this church that need to know Jesus that we can never, ever forget our church planting roots. So next week, we're going to officially kick off Vision 365, praying, believing, interceding, and casting a vision to see 365 people come to know Jesus in the coming year. I pray you will be here next week and be a part of that. So today I'm going to make the assumption that most of you who are in this room, you love Jesus. That's why you're here. I'm praying also that during this time that you will be reminded of just how much Jesus loves you. And that a side effect of that will be that you will be compelled, as that song we sang earlier, to abandon everything to him. That you would live for him with everything that is within you from this moment forward until you go to be with him in eternity. There's a verse found in Ephesians chapter 5, 25, that we often use in the context of marriage. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. It says that Christ loved the church so much that he died for her. Guess what? That her in that sentence is you and me. We are the church. He loved us so much that he died for us. When's the last time you reflected on that? Think about it for just a moment, the impact of that. Reverse the question. Who would you die for? Maybe your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife, someone that's close to you, a loved one. But you know what scripture says? That we are enemies of God, that he died while we were yet sinners, that he died for us as enemies. How many of you would die for your enemies? I'm not signing up to be the first on that list. I've got issues, right? How incredible is that to think of? That he died for you while you were yet an enemy of God. You might say, Eric, I was never an enemy of God. Let's examine scripture and see what it says. 
Romans 5.10 says this, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Let me maybe reword that just a second in light of our series. For if while we were enemies, we were rebooted to God by death in his son, much more now that we are rebooted, shall we be saved by his life. God saved us while we were enemies of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He loved you that much that he would die for you. May we never, ever, ever forget that. See, sometimes we got memory leaks, do we not? I don't know about you, but I certainly do. Sometimes I need to be reminded of that. I need a reboot to put things back into perspective. I don't know if that's you, but that's for me for sure. So how do we know if a reboot is necessary, either personally or corporately? How can you tell if now's the time for a reboot? Maybe one more computer analogy. A reboot is necessary when we personally or the church or an organization reaches a sticking point and is in need of an upgrade. So I think there's two kinds of reboots. There's a reboot for an unbeliever and there's a reboot for a believer. I wanna distinguish between the two. We'll focus first on the reboot for the unbeliever. How many of you have maybe, you got this image of the blue screen of death? Do you guys have that one up there? That one's a pretty pitiful looking version of the blue screen of death. This is what computer people affectionately call the blue screen of death. How many of you have encountered one of these as you were using a computer at some point, right? All you young people are like, what's a computer? All I know is an iPhone or an Android, right? They have them too. They have their version of the blue screen of death. When you get that, that is what is called the fatal error. Pretty much when you get a blue screen of death, It's done, man. You need to reinstall the operating system completely, or it could mean that a hardware problem is present, needs to be replaced physically in order for that computer to come back to life. Can I be honest with you? What scripture teaches us is that we all have a fatal flaw. We all suffer from a blue screen of death. Every single one of us, apart from God, we are dead in the spirit. There is no chance of us coming back to life. We are dead in our trespasses. We are dead in our sin. We all were, by the sinful fallen world that we live in, we all have this fatal flaw that can only be cured by a relationship with Jesus Christ. And he knows it. And he loves us. And he came and he saved us in spite of ourselves. So let's look at these two versions for just a second. Someone who doesn't know Jesus and someone who does know Jesus. So let's start again with the one who doesn't. Sometimes the need for a reboot can come on suddenly. Other times it kind of creeps up on you and you begin to sense that something's going on and it's time for a change. For me, it was kind of suddenly. Back many, many, many years ago in 1992, we were invited by Mary Jo's mom, who's here today. She invited us to go to an Easter service in 1992. Our lives were far from God. I wouldn't have personally called myself hostile to God. But I was, I was standing in opposition to God and his word. I wanted to live my way. I was declaring myself to be my own God. I was doing what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. That meant there was drugs involved. That meant there was alcohol involved. That meant there was expenses and pain and issues that were going on in my family. That meant we were places like Jaguars games or at the beach. No offense to anybody online this morning. Come on, Jesus. Hopefully you got picture in picture going and journey's the bigger picture. And I don't know what the score is, so sorry people. Um, But my life was messed up and I didn't really know it because I thought it was normal. I thought that that's the way we live. That's the way we should go about life. So even so much so that when we were invited for Easter, we didn't show up. We actually went to a new church just to get you mad. (laughs) That's how messed up we were, right? So then out of a sense of guilt, we showed up to church that Mother's Day morning and we're like, okay, I'm here, but we ain't coming back, right? We're coming here in advance. We're show up at this high school, Hollywood Hills High School, Cornerstone Church was meeting there. We're going to go do our duty and we're going to show up and then we're going to leave and we're going to go back about life. And then all of a sudden, God interrupted the equation. We walked in there in enmity to God, standing in opposition to God, not wanting anything to do with a relationship with God. And then they began to play music and all of a sudden, wait, what is that? I've never heard anything like that. They had a time of prayer, much like we did today, and people were getting prayed for, and lives were being changed, and I was like, what is that? And the pastor gets up there, and he begins to preach, and something's resonating with my heart, starting to tell me that there can be a different way, that life can be different, that Jesus died in my place for my sins, that I might have life. And all of a sudden, for the first time, those words began to resonate with me, and I'm like, what is this? 
So we get out and we begin to go to the car. I didn't get saved that day. We get out and we start to go to the car. And Mary Jo's already dreaming of going back to the beach the next week. I'm like, can we go back to church? And she's like, who is this man who is with me? Get thee behind me, Satan, right? She was bad. She was, she was sicker than I was. Come on, Jesus. And to, to, now the reverse is true by far. But um, So we come back the following week. You know, We show back up and we hear him preach. We watch what's going on. We listen to it and God's continuing to move and he's creating a stirring in our heart where we used to want to be at the beach on Sunday morning. We used to want to be doing anything but church on a Sunday morning. We come back yet a third week on May 31st of 1992 and the, the pastor began to preach and all of a sudden he did an altar call at the end. And there was nothing that you could do that could stop us from running up there and surrendering our life to Jesus that day. A life interrupted. We were heading in one direction. We didn't even know we needed a reboot. But God did and he intervened and he touched us. And from that point forward, everything began to happen. It's a, I've been doing a lot with recovery circles again lately. So in AA, they have a saying, God did for us what we could not do for ourselves. God did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Scripture puts it in this way in Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. See, we're all dead in our trespasses. Dead things don't come back to life. You need a miracle for a dead thing to come back to life. We have nothing in us apart from Jesus that would cause us to begin to seek him. It's the Holy Spirit that begins to ignite our hearts by his power, drawing us into a relationship with God. And that's why some of you are here today. You wouldn't call yourself a believer, but God has brought you here on a divine appointment because he wanted you to encounter everything that you've already encountered. And maybe your heart is starting to have butterflies as mine did that day. And he's starting to call you and woo you into a relationship with him. God does the initiating and that is a beautiful thing. He loved you that much. Your salvation is not dependent on you. He comes and seeks us out. How amazing is that? And watch what happens when we finally get it. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. A reboot has happened. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So Eric, this drug-addicted, fatherless, young punk, walks into Hollywood Hills High School standing in opposition to God, and Eric walks out with a new life. He becomes a new creation. God rebooted my life. He saved me. He scrapped the old code. It was no good. He threw it away. He, you know, trashed it. And he gave me this new operating system that he loaded into my life, the best one ever, empowered by the Holy Spirit. The new had come. My spirit is now destined for heaven. He breathed new life into our marriage. He broke the chains of addiction that bound me. He caused me to fall in love with Jesus. He caused me to fall in love with the church. He caused me to pour out my life for him. What else could I do to the one who saved me and delivered me and set me free? What other response could we have? I'm preaching better than you're listening today in Jesus' name. He, he, he changed and reoriented my life where our passion is to see people come to know him. That is the highlight of our lives. And so many of you in this room, you've already experienced that. You're living on fire for God. You're serving him. You're pouring out your life for him. Please continue to do that. May it be infectious. May we change this city by the power of the Holy Spirit. For those of you who haven't experienced that, we pray that you would. We pray that this is the day of your salvation, that today is the day that you see God clearly for who he is, that he loves you and he cares for you, and that it would compel all of us to respond and go out there and reach our city for Jesus Christ. So what about believers? How do we know if we need a reboot? Scripture has numerous references to examining our life in light of God's word under the power of the Holy Spirit. Because of the Spirit, we are new creations, as I read. He initiates the change because now we are spiritually alive and not dead. Something in us hopefully invites this examination, and now we have the ability to change by the power of the Holy Spirit something we didn't have, desire, or want to do prior to coming to know him. 
So see, to the unbeliever, sin is the normal state of effect. I didn't feel like I needed to repent for doing drugs every day. I didn't feel like I needed to repent for living like the things of the world because the Holy Spirit was not in me. But once I became a believer, and yes, I still struggled with addiction for four years after becoming a believer, there was something that was different because now as I would lay my head down to go to bed, something in me was saying, this isn't the life that I had planned for you. I didn't create you so that you could stay stuck in your addiction. You have a, you're a new creation in me. Start to live like it. Now, Scripture also says there is now, now therefore no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It is no license to sin. But I would lay my head down at night and I would say, God, I don't want to do this again tomorrow. That was something I wouldn't pray prior to becoming a believer. So outwardly, there were aspects of my life that really looked like I was not a believer. But inwardly, because of the Holy Spirit empowering me, there was something inside of me that was saying, Lord, help me. I cried out for a couple of years before that help actually came. You see, sometimes he delivers people in an instant. For me, I believe God kind of spoke to me and said, Eric, if I would have delivered you in an instant, you'd be the same jerk you used to be. For you, it's going to take a little bit more of a process. See, sometimes we're delivered in an instant. Sometimes we're delivered through a process. Both are a miracle. Both are a miracle. And God wants to do miracles in your life. Where are you stuck? Are you willing to go through the, the examination? See, in AA, they have a saying that we should take a fearless and searching moral inventory of ourselves. It's not a fun thing. It doesn't sound like it's fun either, does it, right? Where we look at ourselves and look at our character defects and look at our challenges. Some of us think we're perfect. Ask your spouse. Ask the person next to you. You are not perfect. You, you got issues. If you think you're perfect, ask them. They'll tell you what's up. They'll, they'll hook you up. Do it with grace, people. Come on, Jesus. Be nice to those around you. Love you. But if you think you're perfect, then you really need a reboot, right? But are you willing to go through that process under the power of the Holy Spirit if you're to be all that he created you to be? See, I think oftentimes we shy away from that. If you take it one leg forward and I'm talking about living a life on mission, how can you live a life on mission if you're all jacked up with habitual sin in your life? Why are we not living on mission more than we should? Why do we walk around feeling guilty all the time? Because many of us are sinning at the root all the time, and instead of crying out to God, we're just going around and accepting it as normal, accepting these flaws in our operating system as if they should be there, but God is saying, you are a new creature, you're a new creation, those things should not stay, and that code's got away, it's gotta go by the wayside. So today I challenge you, and before we go, I want to encourage you to put these two scriptures into practice. This is a very, very short but bold prayer. Psalms 26, 2. Examine me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind and my heart. I dare you to pray that prayer. I dare you to pray that prayer. It's a scary one. We're all being pretty quiet. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. 28. But a man must examine himself, and so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. A man must examine himself. Man church, come on guys. We need to man up, we need to be here this Saturday, we need to go through this fearling, fearless and searching moral inventory of ourselves. But it's not only the men. I know this is in the context of communion, but the first part of the sentence certainly makes sense. We don't need to wait till communion to examine our hearts. We could do it at any moment. There's no need to stay where we're at, especially if we're struggling. If we go back to what we talked about the last few weeks in terms of koinonia, all of us want to be in healthy, meaningful relationships with other people, right? What that scripture is telling us yet again is that if you want your other relationships to be straight, your relationship with God has to be right first. Your relationship and understanding of who you are in Christ has to be set first. And then out of that, all those horizontal relationships in life can come to fruition in a healthy way because now you have a proper understanding of who he is, who you are, and you could be of service to your family, to your spouse, to your friends, to your coworkers because you've got things in proper order. Let's not get it backwards and let the things of this world influence us. It is so important to remember this and not beat ourselves up. Guess what? All of us have character defects. 
Every one of us, we all have issues, we all have challenges. God loves us enough for us to not be there. But here's a very important scripture that I think we all need to remember. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's your new operating system. You're a masterpiece in him. The old flawed you is gone. The iPhone 10's got nothing on the operating system that God wants to load into your heart and into your mind and apply to your spirit. It'll come out bug free day one. Come on, Lord. You'll be able to move in the spirit and walk in him. And next week, I want to encourage you to be here because I'm going to talk about the purpose of your life. What has God created you for? It has a lot to do with what that scripture is. What is your unique purpose and how can you live that out? We all want to find meaning in this life. Come back next week, bring somebody with you because I'm going to share with you that secret so that we can all put it into practice. I think it'll blow you away. So many of us though are stuck. We're distracted in this generation, aren't we? We've got memory leaks. We forget who we are. For many, we have a lot of sin, these viruses that are creeping around in our lives that God wants to do away with. And it's causing us to fall short of living the kind of life that God would have for us. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to do the work that only he could do. He wants to change us right here in this place this morning. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes today? Would you listen to this verse and just contemplate it for a moment in your heart and your spirit? 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Again, it's God initiating. Maybe he's doing that in your heart right now. You didn't want to change, but something's happening in your spirit this very second. It says, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. We can't clean ourselves up. Only he could do that work. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. His desire for us is that we would be whole in spirit, soul, and body the way that he created us initially for that sinful operating system that we had. He wants to wipe out and replace it with the power of his Holy Spirit so that we have the power to succeed, that we have the power to overcome, that we have the power against sin and death that no longer has to rule and reign in our life. So as you find yourself here today, I ask you, do you feel that you're at a place where you need a reboot? Are there areas of your life that are stuck? Maybe I'm being too graceful. Are there areas of habitual sin in your life that you can't overcome on your own and you need God's help? That's what this moment's about. Are you in need of that instant reboot here today? You walked in and you didn't call Jesus your Lord, but for some reason you feel compelled. He's touching your heart. Today is the day of your salvation. Would you surrender your life to him at this very moment? Or maybe you are at a point of an upgrade. Man, you've been going through life and amazing things are happening as a believer in Jesus Christ, but you know that there's more. You know that he's got different purposes and plans and you want him to reveal those to you right now in this place. You want to see that next step that he has for you so that you can begin to put it into practice. I believe God wants to speak to you in this place today. I want to believe that he wants to save some, he wants to deliver some, and he wants to upgrade some this morning. So if that's you with nobody looking around, here's what I'd ask. I'd love to pray for you. I promise to do nothing to embarrass you, but here's what I have you do. Would you raise your hand up high if you know you need a reboot today? I see your hand and yours and yours and yours and yours and yours and yours and yours. Let me be honest, and I don't usually do this. There's more of you that need a reboot. Maybe you're scared, maybe you're nervous of what that might entail. You're afraid to raise your hand. You're afraid what the future might look like. I'm telling you, it'll be more glorious than you could ever imagine. Don't stay stuck. Don't stay stuck. So here's what I'm going to do. I promise again, I'm not going to embarrass you, but I'm going to come to the front. And if you raised your hand or you didn't and know that you should have, I want to pray with you. And here's what's going to happen. Everybody around you is going to cheer more than if they got an iPhone 10. I mean, they're going to be excited for you. So would you do this? If you raise your hand, come to the front. 
Make your way right up here. I see some. God bless you. Glad you're here. Stay right here. I'll pray for you guys. Come on, sister. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Stay right here. God is moving. God bless you. So glad you're here. There were others. If you raised your hand, come on up to the front. I saw a few more. God bless you. Thank you, sister. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Come on, Lord. All right, it's, come on, God bless you. So glad you're here. All right, I, I see a lot of ladies up here. That means we're gonna have to do some forced reboots next Saturday morning. We're gonna, we're gonna force the issue. Would you bow your heads for one more moment? Lord, we just thank you. We are excited. We praise you today. We thank you for what you're doing, the fact that you still touch and change lives, that you still deliver, that you still set free, that you still upgrade, Lord God. And I am so proud of those who walk to the front today, whether they're here to make that first time decision, Lord, what a blessing that is, or if they've been believers for some time and are struggling with something and they're looking for their breakthrough today, or if they're just ready for that upgrade, Lord God, whatever it might be, we thank you for their boldness and raising their hand and coming to the front. We pray that you would meet them in this place today, that you would touch and change their lives, that they would walk out of here and life would be different from this moment forward and forevermore, that like I remember May 30th, 31st of 1992, that they would remember this as the day that you moved in their life, the day that you intervened in their life, the day that you instilled them with that new operating system. And Father, because we do have memory leaks, Lord God, we pause and we remember and we recite right now that Jesus, you are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life. You sought us out while we were standing in enmity with you. We were your enemies and many of us didn't even know it. You loved us enough to die for us while we were not even seeking you. May we never forget that. May you bring it to our memory often. May it cause us and compel us to desire to live for you with everything that we have with us and to tell the world about what you have done. For those who are at the front, before you go back to your seats, they have a little bit of next step information they'd like to give you. Again, they promise not to hold you and not to embarrass you. They'd like you to fill out a little form so they could start you off in the right way. Would you give them one more big round of applause? <laughs> Care team, if you take care of them. God bless you guys. Thank you to everyone else for being here. Come join me in the newcomers luncheon. Have a wonderful day, and I hope to see you next week. If we've not met, feel free to stop by, but I'd love to see you in the back. Let's have lunch together.